Thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, we're going to change up just a little bit from what I said last Wednesday night. I uh, just felt like this uh, introduction tonight will launch us into more of our study. Because we don't understand tonight's lesson, then the other studies may not be as meaningful. And so and you'll understand what I'm talking about here in just a few moments. As we're going to go into uh, basically the numerology of Scripture. In other words, uh, the, the numbers, what they mean, what they represent. And why is that so important? And towards the end of our lesson, uh, many of you have maybe heard this before, but you're going to hear and see something so amazing, so fascinating, that only, only, only God can make this happen. Okay, let's have prayer. So, Father, I pray for us tonight. I pray you'll bless us as we study together, as we grow in your grace and truth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, so far we have talked about, again, how does God communicate? And what we looked at, first of all, is nature and conscience. We said that all you have to do is look around and see that God has done some amazing work. Uh, the sun is just the right distance away. The moon, just the right distance away. The moon's just the right size. Uh, we live in a solar system uh, that has planets that, again, protect our Earth. You know, the gases that we breathe in, 78% uh, nitrogen, 21% oxygen, other trace elements that are mixed just right so that we can have uh, this air that we breathe each and every moment of our life, each and every second. And so we, we know that we are fearfully, wonderfully made by God and for God. You know, the heart, the brain, the eyes, I mean, all these things are so amazing, so intricate, that only God <clears throat> could do this. So we know that through nature, if you will, God speaks of who he is. We've been made by him and for him. Our conscience tells us we know what is good, we know what is evil. Why? Because there is a God who's declared, this is good, this is evil. And we understand that no one had to tell us how to lie. We just came naturally and we knew it was wrong. We knew that, again, when we steal from somebody, naturally we know it's wrong. Where does that come from? How do we know that? Because the Word of God makes it very clear. He has etched His law, if you will, in our heart. So through creation, through conscience. And last week, I talked about the covenants of God uh, and the fact that God has given certain promises and covenants down through the ages that we can see and measure even to this day. But tonight, we're going to look at something a little different. By the way, spoiler alert, uh, for those of you who show up on Sunday morning, the intro to Sunday morning's message and tonight's intro are going to be pretty much the same. So if you're going, hey, deja vu, no, it's really the same intro. Okay, so, so just bear with me. But tonight we're going to look at something that most of us never learned about or maybe we forgot about because it happened a long time ago in a land far away. Matter of fact, it happened in the year 1977. So just so I can embarrass the older people in the room, how many were around in 1977? Can I see a show of hands? I want to see who I'm talking to. Okay, so for, every, for all the non-boomers, just stay with us, Okay. So 1977, something amazing happened. By the way, 1977 was a unique year for me. I was entering my senior year of high school. I had my first car. It was a 1965 Ford Mustang, and I was on top of the world. I'm just telling you. Okay. So 1977 was an amazing year. Also, there was a year that Star Wars came out. Remember that? Uh, okay, Star Wars. Whew. Okay, Star Wars, right? Darth Vader, the whole bit. So it came out in 1977. Something else happened in 1977 that basically changed how I began to think about the things of God. And what happened was the spacecraft Voyager, boom, there it is. The spacecraft Voyager was sent into space. Now, here's the amazing thing about the spacecraft Voyager. It was basically, literally, a Star Trek mission. It was to go into the, our solar system and beyond. And what they were trying to do is this. What they wanted to know is, is there life out there? And if so, we need to prepare so that if this spacecraft gets intercepted by intelligent life, they will know something about us. And so NASA scientists began to say, how are we going to do this? If this thing gets intercepted, how are they going to know something about our planet, our civilization? And so they made a gold record. Now, what you see on this, this is solid gold. This is not a 500,000, you know, buy, you know, bought record, which is what a gold record is, you know, in, in, in Hollywood terms. But this is a solid gold record. Now, what you see there on that solid gold record is instructions on how to use this solid gold record in case some life form, some intelligent life form found it. Now, the amazing thing is they put some amazing things on this gold record. One of the things they put on was the uh, noises of nature. 
So you, there's waterfalls, there's rainfalls, there's whales, you know, that are doing their thing, you know, whatever, you know, there, there's that. Uh, there's greetings in many languages. They even put some music on there. And the music they put on there, they called the three Bs. Now, if you're living in 1977, what do you think, who do you think made the cut to have music on this record? Any, just any guesses, just kind of play along. Bee Gees, Beatles, anybody? Bachman Turner. Turner, who? Barry, Barry Manilow. You know, those are my three Bs. I said the Bee Gees bread. I mean, come on. Bread is like the most romantic group ever. Okay. And I know some things about romance. So you had the Bee Gees, you had bread. I thought bread, I thought Bachman Turner Overdrive or Barry Manilow. No, it was Bach. Beethoven and Chuck Berry. <laughs> As a matter of fact, in 1977-1978, uh, Saturday Night Live had a sketch with Steve Martin basically about this thing. The aliens are saying, send us some more Chuck Berry. Okay. All right. <laughs> so you have Bach, Beethoven, and Chuck Berry on this along with, again, a letter from President Jimmy Carter. So again, here's the question. So if this if this intelligence that's out there, and by the way, this thing's still flying. It's still flying out there. As a matter of fact, next slide, what it was designed to do, it, as a matter of, that, that's what they call the uh, small blue dot. That's planet Earth, by the way. Taken from around Pluto. As this thing is going, it ripped around almost every planet in our solar system and again, went, went further, and this is our planet. There it is. There, there's the, the blue dot. That's us. And that little, that's a, basically a, some sunshine, a ray of sunshine that's cutting through. But there you are. You see yourself there? That's planet Earth from Pluto. And it's going further out. It's still sending signals back to NASA, but by the year 2030, it will be so far out into intercellular space that it will no longer be able to retrieve signals. But there it is. That's taken from about Pluto from the Voyager. Now, why am I telling you this? Because in 1977, as a teenager, I, I was a good kid. I was kind of a Richie Cunningham kind of kid, but I was a skeptic. I, mean, I was kind of raised to be a skeptic. Most of my family, um, grandparents and, and others, uncles, and they, they were attorneys or teachers. And so I learned to think critically. Uh, my grandmother's two brothers, uh, one was a defense attorney there in her, their town, the other was the, the district attorney. And it was said that back in the 1930s and 40s, they were the town entertainment. Imagine that. And so I would hear all these debates going on as a kid. So I was very critical. Here's my point. How do you know God's there was my thought. And then my second thought was this. If God was trying to reach us, like we're trying to reach somebody out there somewhere with a gold record, how would God do that? How would God, who is, again, God, and here we are, humans, and here we are in this, this small blue dotted planet, you know, how would, how would God do that? And so what dawned on me was this, as I began to explore that question was this, there has to be some universal way that God would communicate to us. And I learned one thing in psychology, and that is we are wired, our brains are wired to think in patterns. We look for patterns, okay? Weather patterns, you know, patterns with your kids, patterns in politics, patterns in what, we look for patterns. Our brains are wired to look for patterns. And so what I began to recognize was this, and this is back when I'm like 16, 17, I'm a skeptic, you know, I was a good kid, but you know what, the whole God thing I wasn't sure about. But I realized something, that numbers really are a universal language. And then out came the movie Close Encounter, right? Where the dun, 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 dun. For those of you who saw the movie, don't worry. Dun, 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 dun. And so they were communicating in this movie with alien forces using patterns and numbers. Here's the amazing thing that we're about to discover tonight. God in his word has given numbers that these numbers are significant. These numbers are consistent with certain patterns. For example, we're going to just kind of start with all the numbers we've heard about. The number seven, 
The number seven basically is, means the number of completion or perfection. For example, we all know that God rested on the seventh day. We all know that one. Sunday school, you all learned that one. Passover, the first holiday you know, of, of, of our year, if you will. It's, we're about to celebrate it here in a few weeks. Passover lasts for seven days. Debts were canceled every seven years. We call that the Shemitah. Seven is the number of completion and perfection. Seven churches in the book of Revelation. Seven angels bringing seven disasters in the book of Revelation. Verses, uh, chapters 8 through 9. A, a woman rides a beast with seven heads. Revelation 17. As a matter of fact, there's 600 occurrences in the Bible alone just about the number seven. Keep that in mind. Kind of, kind of, kind of hold on to that one. The number 12 basically is a number of governmental completeness. We got the 12 sons of Israel, the, t- the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 apostles in, Jeru- in the new Jerusalem. In the book of Revelation, there are 12 gates, 12 angels. Uh, there are 12 foundations. There's the number 40. You've all heard of that number, right? The number 40. Uh, 40 days and 40 nights, the rain came down for Noah's flood. We all know that one. But Moses fasted for 40 days when he received the Ten Commandments, or before he received the Ten Commandments. Uh, Israel wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. Jesus began his ministry 40 days after being in the desert, right before he was tempted by Satan. 40 is the number for trial and testing. Now, here's the thing. You see this throughout the Word of God. These numbers, each one of these numbers, have a certain meaning, have a certain pattern. The number 666 is a number that we're all familiar with. If you want to turn there just for a brief moment, that's found in Revelation chapter 13. We'll just kind of open our Bibles to that one and unpack that one just a little bit. And the reason why we're going to just unpack it just for a moment, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but just for a moment, is because... It gives you some indication as to the power and the importance of numeric value. Revelation chapter 13, verse 16 says this. Now he's talking about the Antichrist here, and he says, And he causes all the small and all the great and the rich and the poor and the free men and the slaves to be given a mark on their right hand, on their forehead. And he provides that no one else be able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for the number is that of a man, and his number is 666. Now, the the reason why I want to unpack this just for a brief moment is this, that's called a gematria, which means that in the Hebrew language and in the Greek language, every letter had a number that correlated with it. For example, in our vernacular, the number A would be, or the letter A would be the number one, letter B would equal number two, etc. And so, in that day and age, you would not write a number down the way we'd write a number, but you basically would write letters to represent numbers. And so, the point made simply is this: is that this number is a found again here in the Word of God. It identifies a particular person, a particular time, a particular event. But one of the things that again I just was I, as I was reading this, as we've all experienced the last three years, this, these words in verse 17. And he provides that no one will be able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. Now, over the years, I, I've preached on this topic. I've preached on this scripture. And, and many times people say to me, well, Mark, I mean, come on. I mean, how do you enforce that? How can that be enforced? I mean, there's no way that the world would ever, you know, you know, turn and, and say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to take the number. I'm not going to take the mark. There's no way. And then 2020 happened. And we saw real quickly how in a matter of weeks, not to buy or sell, but just to go into a restaurant, Not to buy or sell, but just to go to Disney World. Not to buy or sell, but just to get on a plane. There are certain things that you had to do. And after that happened, I read that scripture again, and I'm going, Shazam, that's how. He provides that no one 
we'd be able to buy or sell. There are some places you couldn't even go into a bank without certain restrictions. Except the one who has the mark either by the name of the beast or the number of his name. Again, the point is, is that numbers are very powerful and very important in the word of God. But let's move on. The number one is a sense of singleness. We see that in Deuteronomy 6, 4. The Lord thy God, the Lord is one. Again, I meet a lot of folks who say, uh, who are non-Christians or, or maybe who, uh, maybe of another particular uh, faith of some sort. They say, you Christians, um, y'all are confused. Either you believe in one God or three gods. I go, no, we just believe in one God. The Lord thy God, the Lord is one. Well, what about the Trinity? I said, well, the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And they go, well, one plus one plus one doesn't equal one, bruh. And I said, but one times one times one does, bruh. <laughs> one times one times one still equals one. The Lord thy God, the Lord is one. God the Father God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit. The number two is simply that of witness and support. Uh, we see this in Ecclesiastes 4.9. Um, we see this in Genesis 1.16. Two great lights, two witnesses, established truth according to the word of God, Matthew 26.60. Uh, to have two witnesses, that establishes truth. And you also see this in the word of God. Whenever the word of God is making a primary point, you have at least two examples or two passages of scripture, if you will. Uh, they were sent out two by two in Luke 10.1. The number three signifies unity, completion, perfection. Once again, in John uh, 2.19, uh, Jesus says, kill this body in three days, I will raise it up from the grave. Again, I use that scripture for those who say that Jesus is not God. So I ask people who raised Jesus from the grave, who raised him from the dead. Because he says in John 2.19, he says, kill this body in three days, I will raise it up. Jonah in the bell, in the belly of the well, Matthew 12, 40, for three days. Uh, Jesus' earthly ministry lasted for three years. So the number three is, a, again, the number four, unity. The number four relates to earth. We got four seasons, we got four corners, we got four primary directions, we got four types of soil found in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 13, the four types of soil. If you're not familiar with that, uh, that parable, Jesus says, you know, the soil went out to sow, and one landed on rocky soil, one landed on very thin soil, uh, one landed on soil that was, that was full of weeds, and one landed on soil that was very fertile. And so he's using the four soils, if you will, in Matthew 13. Uh, the number five uh, is the number of grace. Uh, uh, we have the five loaves that, again, Jesus dealt with in Matthew 14, feeding 5,000 people. Uh, the number six is the number of man. Adam was created and Eve was created on the sixth day. So six is the number of humanity. Uh, again, it is less than perfection. Uh, the number seven, of course, being completion and perfection. Uh, humanity is the number six. Thus, the number 666, many will argue, is that of a very evil individual, evil person. We look at also the number eight, meaning new beginnings. Uh, John 20, 26, eight days later, the word of God says this began to happen. Uh, eight people survived the flood. Uh, circumcision was on the eighth day, a little sidebar. Uh, circumcision was given and said to the nation of Israel, do this on the eighth day. It was not till 1946 that medical science discovered why God said the eighth day. Not only is it a day of new beginning, if you will, but that's also when vitamin K is at its height in the, in the, in the uh, baby, uh, a little baby boy. And when vitamin K is at its peak, that is when the blood will clot easily and readily, making it an almost a bloodless surgery. And that was not discovered until 1946. But God said years before, we circumcised the baby boy on the eighth day. And because that time, vitamin K is at its height in a, in a little baby. Number nine is the fullness of blessing. Uh, you have nine fruits of the Spirit in the book of Galatians. The number 10 relates to the law. Exodus 20, uh, 1 through 17, you have the Ten Commandments. Uh, ten tribes made up the northern kingdoms. So the number 10 relates to the law. 
So those are all some very interesting things we're going to look at. Number 30 uh, also means mourning and sorrow. And you see that in the word of God. Uh, 30 pieces of silver was used, if you will, uh, to betray Jesus. Aaron's death, they mourned for 30 days in Numbers 20, verse 29. In Moses' death, they mourned for 30 days, Deuteronomy 34, 8. So 30 is the number for mourning. 50 is the number for the year of Jubilee which simply means that 50 is a celebration. Uh, It is a time of great ceremony. Uh, The 50th year proclaims liberty. We're going to talk about that some more. Leviticus 25, verse 10. The Feast of Pentecost celebrated uh, 50 days after Passover. Leviticus 23, 15. Therefore, 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus, the Holy Spirit shows up on the day of Pentecost. Here's my point. These numbers are significant. These numbers are unique. These numbers are not found in any other piece of religious literature on the planet. So God is basically saying these numbers have meaning, they have significance, and there's a pattern throughout the Word of God with these numbers. The number 70 is the number of judgment and human delegation. Ezekiel 8.11. 70 men uh, of the elders of the house of Israel, 70 elders appointed by Moses. Uh, Israel spent 70 years in captivity in Babylon in Jeremiah 29 verse 10. But now you put your seatbelt on because I have a challenge for all of us. I've used this before just a little bit uh, in a message a few months ago. But here's what I want us to do. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 1. The genealogy of Jesus. And here is what was discovered when a scholar, PhD in mathematics from Harvard, a former, a man from, the form, from former Russia, Dr. Ivan Panin, P-A-N-I-N, discovered what he called the heptatic structure, the heptatic structure or the seven, number seven pattern. He wrote 43,000 pages of his discoveries on what is called the heptatic structure. You mark, what is that? I have no idea what that means. Okay, so here's what I want you to do. Here, here, here's, here's, here's the assignment. I want you to write down, you don't have to do it literally right now, but play along, a genealogy. It can be your genealogy. It can be a genealogy that you make up, but a genealogy. Now, here's how this plays out. The number of words in your genealogy must be divisible by seven evenly. So far, so good? So the number of words in your genealogy must be divisible by seven evenly, okay? Now, most of you could do that, right? You come up with seven names. Well, in like in my family, you know, I got Homer. Yes, my grandfather was named Homer. You got Homer and his wife's name was Johnny. Okay, so far, so good. You know, you got my mom, Joyce, dad, Bob, okay? I can probably go up beyond that, but I can probably put seven names in my genealogy. Okay, no problem. But now the number of letters in those names must total and be divisible by seven. Now how are we doing? Okay, let's move on. The number of vowels and the number of consonants in your genealogy must be divisible by seven. So far so good? Okay. Now the number of words that begin with the vowel must be divisible by seven. Also, the number that begins with a consonant must be divisible by seven. How are we doing so far? Got your genealogy worked out yet? Okay. Now, the number of words that occur more than once must be divisible by seven. Oh, it gets better. The number of nouns in your genealogy must be divisible by seven. Only seven words must be in your genealogy that are not nouns. The number of names in your genealogy must be divisible by seven. The number of male names in your genealogy must be divisible by seven. The the number of generations shall also be divisible by seven. So how did we do? Here's what we know. The Greek and the Hebrew language have a numeric value for each letter. 
Each word has each word, therefore, or every word, therefore, has the value. Now, here's what we understand. The chances of a person able to write down the genealogy that I just gave you with all those conditions, and there are only like seven or eight conditions that I gave you. Actually, total, there's like 34 conditions. I just gave you seven or eight. Is one chance in 40 million. Or put another way, if you spent 2,000 hours a year, that is eight hours a day for 50 weeks, it would probably take you, based on mathematical probability and all that goes with that, about 3,362 years to figure out the nine rules that I just gave you. But it gets better. If you were to add more than that, okay, if you were to add more than that, it would probably take you, like if you were to do all 35 of the conditions found in, in Matthew chapter 1 of the genealogy of Jesus, it would probably take you 4 million years using a computer. Well, everybody knows the Bible was just written by man. What? <laughs> How do you explain that? And that's just one of many areas of the New Testament that meets the heptatic structure that, humanly speaking, we could not do with computers and with four million years. But there you have it in black and white in your Bible in Matthew chapter 1. And the amazing thing simply is this, ladies and gentlemen. This is just one of many areas where the numerology of the Bible is so precise, so fine-tuned, only divisible by seven. For example, the last 12 verses of Mark, hear this. Again, in the Greek language, and the Greek language, by the way, is perhaps the most precise language known to humanity. It is the most precise language. As we said before, in our language, for example, this is a very weak, poor example, but in our language is English. We only have one word for love, right? There are like four or five words for love in the Greek language because every word is to be precise. So when I say, you know, I love my daughter, when I say I love my wife, when I say I love my, my friend, when I say I love my mom, my sister, those are, that's all in English the same word. But in the Greek language, really and truly, those are different words, and they should be different words. Still the word love, but a different word altogether. That's the point. So in the last 12 verses of the Gospel of Mark, and th these are just five things that, that, that there's many, but just give you some idea. In the last 12 verses of the Gospel of Mark, in the Greek language, there are 175 words. That is 7 times 25. There's 98 different words. That is 7 times 7 times 2 or 98. There are 553 letters. That's 7 times 79. There are 294 vowels. That's seven times 42. There are 259 consonants. That's seven times 37. Well, it's just a coincidence. No, it's not. <laughs> Help me to understand how that happens. Unless there is a God who watches over and has given every word to his people, through the prophets, through the law, through the apostles. How does this happen? Now, I mean, here's the thing. I'm just giving you a couple of samples of this numeric impossibility in the Greek language found only in the word of God, especially primarily in the Greek language in the New Testament. You do not find this sort of thing anywhere else on this level of precision. And so the question is, back to what I was saying earlier, we sent the space, a spacecraft out in outer space to hopefully give some insight if anybody intercepted those, that golden record about who we are. 
God gives us his word. And he says, here's what I want you to know about me. Everything is precise. Everything is exact. Everything is there by divine origin. And here is how you can prove it's there by divine origin. Because you human beings could have never done this. It is there only because of divine origin. That's why, turn your Bibles to Matthew if you want to follow along. Here's how Jesus puts it in Matthew chapter 5. And we're going to get to, and we're going to spend a lot of time when we get to it on the uh, reasons we believe the, the Bible is the Word of God. We're going to spend a lot of time, but this is just kind of give you some introduction. Uh, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, here's what Jesus says. Now, again, this is his Sermon on the Mount. This is his, like, major communication to, to his disciples, to his people. He says this in Matthew chapter 5, 17. He says, do not think that I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. He would later say in, in the gospel of Luke, he would later say, look, everything in the Old Testament, if you will, everything in the law of the prophets, they talk about me, they speak about me, but it goes on. He says this in verse 18. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass away from the law until all is accomplished. Here's what Jesus is saying in our vernacular. He's saying the smallest letter or stroke, that's like saying even the little dot above an I, even the little line that makes a T, that precise, he's saying, the smallest letter or stroke will be fulfilled completely. Everything, not the smallest letter or stroke. Read it one more time. Verse 18. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass away from the law until all is accomplished. He is saying everything that the word of God says is going to happen. He says it's going to happen. Everything that's in there, the smallest stroke, the smallest letter, everything that the Word of God says is going to happen will happen exactly the way it said. Well, how can we know that? Just look at what you just discovered. Look at, again, this number seven, this heptatic structure, and how, again, there is no way it is humanly impossible for humanity to have done that. And those, again, are just two samples. You see this throughout the New Testament. And so, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I will say to you, help me to understand, other than God putting that there, how that happened. When even with the most advanced computers, and after, with four million years of time to do that, we still could not do it. So, this, one, this is one reason why I think these, this, this is so important, which means one of the things we'll be studying real soon, this is just kind of a little preview, and that is we're going to be looking at, again, the Ten Commandments. We're going to be looking at the seven uh, feasts of Israel and how these seven feasts of Israel, as we begin to approach you know, the Easter season or in, in the uh, uh, Jewish uh, faith, the, the, the season of Passover, how these seven festivals or holidays uh, uh, of, of Israel, how they line up with Messiah. That Jesus didn't die just on any day. He dies on Passover, the first major Jewish holiday. He doesn't, uh, he's not buried on, on just any day. He is buried on the day of unleavened bread. He doesn't rise again just on any day, but he rises from the dead on the days, if you will, of, 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 of the, 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 the fruit. And so what begins to happen here is the first fruits. And what begins to happen here is that you begin to see first fruits, his resurrection, um, unleavened bread, his, his, his burial, the day of Passover, his crucifixion. And then, and then we see, you know, 40 days later, 50 days later, the Spirit of God shows up, exactly fulfilling the Feast of Sukkot or the Feast of Pentecost. This pattern, these numbers, 
All of these things point to one thing, and that is God has fearfully and wonderfully made us. He's put all of this together and basically saying, look, just like we sent that out into outer space, he's saying, look at these patterns. Look at what I have to offer you. Look at the pictures that I'm giving you. Look at the, look at the numbers and how they mean something, how these numbers are consistent throughout my word. And so you again, Passover, unleavened bread, the Feast of First Fruits, the, the Feast of Pentecost, you know, and then those are just the, the four feasts uh, in the spring and summertime. And then there's three feasts, seven in all, in the fall. And why they're so important and why they are a picture of Messiah and why they're a picture of our redemption and how they're a picture of our salvation. Again, when Jesus, we, we say this every communion, when Jesus took a cup of wine, if you will, celebrating Passover, he took the cup, the third cup of redemption. Everything in the Word of God has this amazing picture of significance. So that, again, asking my question, you know, when I was 16 or 17, if God is there, how would he communicate to us? And this is how. Through numbers, through prophecies, through holidays and pictures, all again lining up, all again pointing to Messiah, all again saying, look at... Look at Jesus dying on Passover, the day that little lambs were killed or sacrificed for the sins of humanity. So Jesus doesn't die, you know, on January 10th. He dies in the spring during Passover. This is powerful. This is important because God is now putting this all together so that we can see the patterns, so that we can see the numbers, so that we can see that God really does have all of this put together so that he can communicate to us one major thing. I love you, and I've done something amazing for you. That is his, that is his message. I love you, and I have done something amazing for you. And when you receive that message and you embrace that message, it changes your life forever. I don't know if that gold record is going to find intelligent life out there. I don't know. But if they do and they do find it and they do figure out what it's on there, that's going to be an amazing discovery for somebody out there somewhere, out there somewhere, or somewhere out there. Anyway, my wife hates it when I do that. You got a song for everything. <laughs> but somebody out there, if they discover that, they're going to say, wow, what is this all about? What, what's this Chuck Berry song? Where is Louisiana anyway? You know, what's ringing a bell? You know, for those of you, Johnny, be good. Just those part of the, okay. So anyway, so, so, but God is looking at us saying, here's what I've given you. And here's my message. I love you. And I have done something amazing for you. So we're going to get into that some more uh, next uh, Wednesday night, looking at the holidays uh, of Israel as we get closer to uh, Passover. Uh, we're going to be looking at the commandments of God. We're going to be looking at these shadows and pictures of things to come. And again, how, again, Jesus is the fulfillment of the shadows and pictures of things to come. Uh, we're going to be looking at, again, uh, just some of the uh, prophetic profiles of people like King David and Moses and all of these individuals that, again, points to one thing, that Jesus is the Messiah and he is the Son of God and he came to bring life to you and his message is, I love you and God has something special for you. I'm going to pause there because I know there may be a question or two that I've, been not, I've not been giving you time to ask any questions. Questions or comments or thoughts? Anyone? Anyone? Bueller? Bueller? Anybody? Yes, sir. Has uh, 666 ever been deciphered to a particular person? E no. <laughs> <laughs> to answer that question, there have been many who have tried. Uh, some have, you know, looked at the Pope. Some have looked at Henry Kissinger. Some even looked at Ronald Reagan. Some have looked at just a number of people down through the ages, you know, Charlemagne. Some even tried to pin it on Hitler. So, so many have tried, um, but no one has really had anything definitive or, or exact. And so uh, that's been kind of a project for lots of people. Um, but again, that's one of the things that we read in the scripture. Some thought it was uh, back, back in the day, maybe Nero. Okay. So, so there's just been a lot of uh, conjecture 
but nothing, nothing definitive. So the reason why I said yes, yeah, people have tried to put different ones, but nothing has been definitive. Good question. Anybody else? Thoughts or questions? Yes, yes. Oh, yeah. Right, right. And the two pastors that uh, host that show said no. Uh-huh. And they cited the uh, creation in Genesis and you know, the heavens and the earth. Right. People. Right. Uh, and they quoted some other scriptures at the back of that. Sure. What is the answer? <laughs> Thank you, Mark, for that question. <laughs> That's a good question. Here, here's the thing. Um, I will argue this, that there is, you know, if you begin to look at string theory and quantum physics, not that I know how to do that, but if you were to do that, you would discover that, again, there, there are various dimensions that we live in. We, we know that we live in a three-dimensional world, that kind of thing. But beyond, you know, our dimensions, there are many more dimensions. Some will argue many as ten dimensions, Okay. We do know this, that the angelic realm and the demonic realm, we do know as Christians, even these pastors, I would hope, would believe that. There is a demonic realm and there is an angelic realm. And the Word of God makes it very clear that we live in this world where, again, there is such a thing as a spiritual world. And the spiritual world, I will argue, they're able to come in and out of various dimensions. Okay? It's kind of like if all of a sudden here I am standing and all of a sudden uh, someone would stick their head through the ceiling and look down at us and then pop back up. They would have come into our dimension, if you will. And so I will argue this, that, that there is a demonic dimension, there's an angelic dimension, and I will argue that there is some thought, there is some uh, conjecture, there is some theory, and some would even argue that uh, they have some biblical backing, that the, the Nephilim that we talked about very well could be, again, this hybrid, if you will, of demonic and human that, again, as Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so it shall be with the coming of the Son of Man. You know, part of the days of Noah was this group called the Nephilim. And many will argue, again, I'm not, I'm not saying this is, you know, exact, but this is their theory, that this group, this Nephilim, can and will come through various dimensions into our dimension and go to another dimension. That's one reason why uh, many of the sightings that people are seeing and talking about saying, hey, all of a sudden the, the thing came in and was shot by and all of a sudden, poof, it left. Like, where did it go? Where did it go? You know, it was here a minute ago and then it left. Well, if, again, and I believe that we do, if there's at least 10 dimensions to our universe and they're crossing through the various dimensions, that would at least explain it. Now, again... That's just an idea, a thought, a theory, etc. But here's what I do know. When you die, your body will be here on this earth for a little while. Your spirit and your soul will go into another dimension. It will be the heavenly dimension. And you will be with your heavenly father and those who've gone before you in a dimension that Jesus described, you know, basically as paradise. Paul says, I has not seen or has ear heard the great things God has prepared for those who love them. And so, so I will argue that, again, may back up you know, my idea of the various dimensions because that much we do know. And we do know that, again, we live in a world where there is, again, demons and angels that interact with us for a little while and they go back to another dimension. You see that throughout the Word of God. Does that help a little bit? Thank you. Anybody else? We've got about one minute and one second left. Anyone else? I hope this was helpful. Um, again, I uh, hope you took some notes. If you want to know more about this, I can give you some information, some links, if you will. Um, but this discovery found in the Word of God back in the late 1890s uh, changed how people saw the Word of God because they realized there is no way this is a work of humanity only, that this Bible is really inspired, God-breathed, as the Word of God claims it is, that all words, every word, is breathed from, if you will, from God. So I hope that helps a little bit. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for our time together. We thank you for your Word. And Lord God, I just pray that we'll have a greater confidence and a greater comfort as we study it together, as we recognize, oh God, the amazing dynamics of your Word. May it be a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. 
And Lord God, may we just be so grateful that you took the time, oh God, to want to communicate your message to us, that you love us, and you've done something amazing for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all. God bless you.